Rupert's idea, as I interpret it, is um, science is very important. And science being opposed to these experiences means that science can't advance, and we can't advance. We need science to be revolutionized. He thinks that science is very important because he's a scientist. I mean, he's like a real scientist, not like somebody who reads and talks yeah. about scientists. He's got it in yeah. his blood. He has, you know, he's been... Uh, the training is there, yeah. Yeah, he's a, you know, university professor of cellular biology. Mm -hmm. So uh, his idea was not only to do paranormal research, like study telepathy or something. He wanted to design experiments, make conjectures that would challenge scientists so that they would be so challenged that in the context of their own belief system that these all these questions can be answered by experiments that are reproducible. That they would be so challenged they would have to do the experiments that would radicalize them individually yeah. and eventually uh, as a community. So he thinks of these challenging experiments and ideas. He says uh, the physical constants aren't constant. He looks at the books and the measurements of the speed of light that have been going on for not too long, but a couple hundred years, and there's been a, hey, a gradual shift in this number. So uh, when it came to the paranormal phenomenon, he, he chose uh, dog telepathy because I think he knows that a lot of scientists have dogs, and they know on their own experience that these scientists who own dogs, they have telepathy with their dogs and they know it. Mm -hmm. But they have to deny that. So it's like during the daytime when they're scientists, there is no such thing. And then in the evening when they come home, the dog is waiting. So anyway, that this would be, of all the things you could, you know, there's other people like that uh, materials engineer from Stanford University where the four Tibetan priest uh, try to raise the temperature of water and they succeeded in getting it up several degrees. That is not an experience that scientists have every day. So whereas that's a valid scientific research, it's not going to be revolutionary to the science community. Mm -hmm. So he proposed this work with uh, dogs that know, that became his book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Mm -hmm. And here's how the experiment is done. You know, you know this. Um, so there's the television camera is put in the living room of the house where the dog stays when the owner goes away. Then the owner is told to go away to a certain pub that's 10 miles away or something. And then <clears throat> when uh, the computer gives the random number that tells, you know, when the owner is supposed to start home. Then uh, there's a cell phone call to the owner in the pub. It says, now's the time. You go to the car and start driving home. So the video camera records how frequently the dog goes to the door and waits, then goes back to the couch, then goes to the door and waits. And, back. and these trips to the door become gradually more and more frequent. This was the observation. Uh, after the person is left and up, you know, until several minutes before the arrival, and then the dog just stays at the door. Mm. So this experiment, many repetitions were done, and mm. it proves that uh, dogs do know when their owners are coming home. Mm. And there's no way to phone up the data because the experiment was designed very well from the perspective of experimental science because Sheldrake is that's, that's his business. You, know, you, you can't design a drug and give it to a people on the basis of a faulty experiment. Mm. So <clears throat> um, that kind of thing. Science denies this certain category of experience. Mm. Of course, they're busy studying other categories of experience, like how to make slipperier grease or something. Mm. But uh, they, they deny this. Now, the fact that scientists are so idolized and put on a pedestal 
as purveyors of knowledge and sayers of what is the truth, that the fact that scientists deny these things, like love, like telepathy and so on, mm -hmm. is severely holding this culture back. Mm -hmm. And it's felt that, for example, environmental problems will not caused directly by science, that somehow environmental problems are furthered by the denial of the scientific community, mm -hmm. that they are actually existing. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting case now about uh, global climate warming, where I have been uh, really challenged myself to try to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. So there are some large number of ordinary citizens and also scientists who say global, global climate warming is happening. And then there's another group that says it's not happening. And we know from chaos theory that you actually can't tell if a thing like that is happening or not happening because we don't have any valid mathematical model because the whole enchilada is too complex, a dynamical system to parse it out and make a prediction. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore you can study the data all, all that you want. You can't actually be sure what's going to happen in the future because there are too many factors. Mm. Nevertheless, this group of people is 100% sure it's happening. And this group of people is 100% sure it's not happening. And in this group are actually some very famous scientists. Like Freeman Dyson, for example, an Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He says, global climate warming is the biggest scientific hoax to ever come down the pike. Man. <laughs> Man. That's more than he believes it doesn't exist, but he thinks it was some kind of conspiracy to sell anti-climate warming devices or something. <laughs> so, uh, science has its limitations and is wonderful in its place. My life has been saved by science a couple of times. Uh -huh. But the people shouldn't be idolized so much because there's so many things they don't know. Uh -huh. So to ask if a science can give any information about the love of uh, energy, no, it's the wrong question. Wow. So we have to teach them, we have to teach them uh, about, you know, what, what it's all about, what you mean when you say love through examples and so on, so okay. that they can try it out in their own life and, and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah.